In 2008, the Missoula Art Museum lent 24 pieces of work from our contemporary American Indian collection to the Northwest Museum of Art and Culture in Spokane with the condition and under the condition and understanding that we would be able to borrow the Jesus Corner in exchange. We're grateful to the Northwest uh, Museum of Art and Culture, the MAC as it's called, uh, in sticking to this commitment and uh, being able to share part of our collection but also being able to have the Jesus Corner here. This has been years coming here and uh, we have a few people to thank in order uh, that have uh, made it possible. Barney White with Rocky Mountain Moving and, and uh, Reine King Construction the Paul Allen Family Foundation, and also I noticed some faces here this evening uh, of Paul Allen's sculpture class, which helped us lift the Jesus Corner up those stairs. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for your muscle. Yeah. In 1982, uh, Ed and Nancy Keenholz had an exhibition here in Missoula at the Brunswick Gallery, and at that time, Gordon McConnell uh, interviewed them, and that interview can be um, accessed in the Missoulians Entertainer. We did invite Gordon McConnell here as part of this lecture series, and he was unable to uh, confirm that. So if anybody is wanting to do any local research, I want to steer them in that direction. Uh, Beth Sellers was the first speaker in this series. This is three part, and this is the third and final part. And Beth uh, talked a great deal about how the Jesus Corner came into the Mac collection. And he, she had some very touching stories and some uh, incredible letters uh, from Ed and Nancy, and Ed uh, in his belief in the piece and the strength of the piece. And uh, so it was really great to be able to start off with that series, or that talk, the second talk was a talk by Ted Hughes, and he talked about Ed's uh, framed his position in the uh, LA and California art scene. And so we were very thankful uh, to be able to have that aspect of Ed Keenholt's life, Ed and Nancy's. Uh, Raphael Chacon uh, is professor of art, history of art, and criticism at the University of Montana. He's a longtime friend of the museum, served on the collection committee here at uh, MAM, and he's a good friend of the arts community. And uh, <clears throat> he's going to speak this, this evening about a broader topic related to Ed and Ke Ed Keenholz, and that is his broader influence uh, and impact on artists in the region and in the West. So. Uh, Without further ado, I want to turn this over to Raphael. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for braving uh, the cold out there. I really appreciate your being here this evening. And um, this is a, it's, it's really a, a, a pleasure and an honor to, uh, to speak about Edward Keenholz, an artist that I, um, I, as long as I can remember, I mean, as, since I was a child, I remember admiring this artist, seeing him in the textbooks and hearing about him. Um, and so it's, it's really kind of a wonderful privilege to, uh, to talk and share some thoughts, some ideas about an artist that has intrigued me and fascinated me um, for a long, long time. And when, um, when Stephen and I were talking about the title for this, this is the title that we came up with, Keenholz, Big, Bold, and Brash, which I think uh, are, are accurate. But really, the title that I'd like to give this talk is Keenholz, the Baddest of Them All. <laughs> and and, I, actually, and I, I actually mean bad in, in the kind of Michael Jackson sense of the word. You know, he's, he was bad, you know. Um, so... Um, the, uh, 
by the way, he, this, this is a wonderful photograph that was taken in Berlin by a friend of his, Lothar Wola, uh, a uh, Berlin photographer in 1970. And, uh, and Keenholz, two years later, went back into this photograph and reworked it, removing some of the more uh, salacious parts, <laughs> replacing them with other even more salacious things. But anyway, my, my mother, and I think you've probably, a lot of you heard this growing up, that you know, if you can't say a good thing about someone, then don't say anything at all. Well, I have a lot of bad things to say about this artist, uh, but I, again, I mean bad in the, in the best sense of the term. What, actually, what I'd like to do this evening is to kind of contextualize Keenholz. Uh, it sounds like we've had some really amazing lectures uh, that, that have talked, that addressed the, uh, the piece, uh, The Jesus Corner, directly and his immediate uh, sort of impact in the, in the West, in the Northwest. And what I'd like to do tonight is kind of broaden the conversation a little bit to talk about him in, uh, in the greater context of art movements at the, uh, at the end of the 60s into the early 70s, uh, actually the end of the 50s through the 60s and into the early 70s, really the period in which uh, Keenholz um, had his most uh, prominence and, and caught sort of the imagination of the nation and the, uh, the art world. Uh, so, uh, really, what, I'm, what I want to do tonight is kind of contrast his, uh, his work to the movements of abstract expressionism, pop, and, post, and then eventually postmodernism, which really sort of saw its advent around 1968 and then into, uh, into the next decade. So, um, so uh, what, I'm, what I'm essentially arguing here is how the presence of these two artists uh, it has been a constant presence in the art world through a couple of major movements. Um, and in some ways, they define themselves against these movements or through those, those movements. And actually, I want to point out, too, that, that um, for the purposes of this lecture, when I refer to Keenholz, prior to 1981, uh, I'm really referring to Edward Keenholz. And then after 1981, as per his instructions, I'm actually referring to Keenholz, the unit, which is him and Nancy Redden Keenholz, his, uh, his fifth wife who then became, uh, they were collaborators, and almost every work after that was in fact a collaboration between two, uh, two souls and uh, two very important artists. Uh, and they, in fact, uh, it's, it's Edward Keenholz himself who, who, um, who wanted his work after 1981 to be uh, addressed as a work by Keenholz, meaning the two of them. Okay. So the first, the first comment that I want to make is that he was, in fact, dirtier than every other artist. And, and when I mean dirty, I'm talking about, like, literally dirtier. The Edward Keenholz's art uh, in the late 50s and in the early 60s distinguished itself by being messy, sloppy, and dirty. And that, was, that doesn't mean that it was alien. I mean, certainly Jackson Pollock was a pretty messy artist. If, I mean, look at this. This is, this is pretty messy. It's, in fact, quite chaotic. And I think that that, that sense of uh, emotion and uh, gesture and, uh, and spirit, which you see here in, in these, the splashings of, of, uh, of Jackson Pollock, really sort of made a statement about the potential for art to be less than clean, less than hermetic, less than, uh, than, uh, than secure. That emotional chaos is something that I think made a, a great impact on, on the young uh, Keenholz. Remember, he was not a trained artist. This is a person who, but he was uh, keenly aware of what was happening in the visual arts. So his art really was, in fact, uh, quite filthy. And I mean literally filthy. And that's, and, and that's actually, uh, he placed himself into a world of art that, uh, that was celebrating almost a kind of sloppiness and a kind of uh, a, a vigorous sort of uh, working outside of boundaries. This is the work of a Kazuo uh, Shiraga, uh, Shiraga, who was a, uh, uh, an early performance artist in the, uh, the mid-50s, who's literally making a work of art with his body and mud. So it was literally dirty work. And when you see Edward Keenholz's work, it's dirty. I mean, it looks like it, you know, a conservator needs to go at it <laughs> and polish this thing up. But that was, I think, intentional. I think he was, in fact, uh, literally uh, making the art less. Uh, much of his early art was, in fact, street art. It was literally collected on the streets of LA and the, and the cities where he first uh, lived. And so it, it was, in fact, detritus. It was literally the leftovers of of culture and, and civilization, that's what, he, that's what he worked with, and then applied another layer of dirt and filth and paint or whatever he had at his disposal uh, to make it uh, even more expressive. So this stuff is actually, it's literally quite dirty. This is an early piece uh, from the late 50s, 59, called John Doe. 
we'll talk more about meaning uh, a little bit later. But for now, just I, I'd like you to sort of get a, get a sense of like the the aesthetic here, which is one of it's uh, sort of like that character from the the Peanuts pig pen. Remember him? He almost Keenhold seemed to always have a cloud of dust around him, and certainly that's true of, of the work itself. This is a piece called Illegal Operation from 1962. Uh, in a private in a private collection, the work is in fact intended to be uh, gross, and I mean grotesque, and I mean in in some ways uh, sloppy, looking as if it were in fact uh, uh, found or in a, in a state of decay or erosion. In in contrast, the the great predecessor of the found object, which is in some ways uh, Keenholz's spiritual god father or his grandfather is Marcel Duchamp, who in fact invented the found object. In, uh, his notion was that, that art is in fact all around us in, the, in our immediate world. And, and yet when you compare Marcel Duchamp's work to the found objects that he transformed into great works of art, they're pretty clean. I mean, they look almost sanitized. Of course, this was a brand new urinal when he bought it from the, the, uh, the, uh, the warehouse or the store where he bought this thing. But it's relatively clean, and it's almost as if he, uh, Keenholz was, yes, picking up objects, transforming them, uh, picking up an agenda, much uh, an, an agenda that was created earlier in the 20th century, uh, working with that agenda, but adding his own layers of grit to that agenda. This is the piece that we were just looking at, illegal operation, and it's pretty grotesque. Uh, and I think that sense of like the, I mean, this is beyond Jackson Pollock's drips. And you know, and daubs and and splashes of paint. This stuff is literally dirt and filth and and the 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 the, the stuff that the discards of human civilization or the waste of human civilization. Uh, of course, it had a and and it couldn't be a sharper contrast. Imagine. And what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm going to show you as as we look at his work, sort of to contrast it with with, with the stuff that was considered great art in its time. I mean, this is a, a, a contemporaneous piece. So we were looking at, at uh, it was almost like different parts of the brain were functioning here when looking at these, uh, at these different works of art. This is the work of Ellsworth Kelly, the color field artist from 63, Frank Stella from 64. Beautiful pattern, clean lines, clean edges. Uh, yes, dynamic, alive, whatever, but, but definitely on the, uh, on the, on the, uh, the hygienic side of, of things. Sculpture in this period was also possessed with this concept of cleanliness and, uh, and orderliness and ra rationality to it. And so imagine seeing, in the same universe, seeing uh, Keenholz with, uh, with someone like Tony Smith's uh, piece here. Uh, so uh, so it, these artists were, in fact, in disparate movements. And it's hard to place um, uh, Keenholz in a particular movement. And generally speaking, he's placed with the pop artists. Um, he definitely would not fit into the minimalist camp in artists like Donald Judd and, uh, and uh, Ellsworth Kelly. He was, in fact, in another, in another realm. And that realm is, is, is pop art. But even within the boundaries of pop art, he was a kind of a misfit as well. There were, indeed, artists who were working with this concept of chaos in their art and uh, a kind of irrationality. Uh, this is the work of Jean Tingley. Uh, you know, this, is a, this is a kinetic sculpture which was intended to move and do all kinds of flash and do all kinds of things and ultimately to, to uh, d disintegrate, to self-destruct in a kind of Mission Impossible sort of way. Uh, and in fact, it did. There, it's only alive in, uh, in photographs and, uh, uh, and remnants. It, it, it was, in fact, garbage. It ended as, as garbage. But so Keenholz, in some ways, by working with uh, the, the, uh, the leftovers, if you will, of Western culture, Western civilization, was in some ways uh, advocating for a, a new sort of space, a new arena in, uh, in the landscape of, uh, of pop art, certainly, and art at the end of the, uh, of the uh, in the last quarter of the 20th century. OK. So now here's what you've been all waiting for, to so talk about Keenholz and sex, because the, sex was one of the, one of the big, big themes for him. Um, he was very, very serious, and one of, the, one of the things that distinguishes his art was that it has on, on the surface a kind of almost flippancy and a, a kind of like up yours attitude towards the world, our world, the world around him. But there's no question that he was dead serious about the content of every work that he made. Every piece was in fact social commentary. Every piece had in fact uh, deeply uh, transgressive uh, uh, subject matter. 
Uh, and so most, a lot of his work is about sexuality, changing sexual mores um, at, at the time. And of course, if you consider, this is the late, he began his career in the late 50s, uh, the career climaxes in the late 60s uh, and into the early 70s. This is the period of the sexual revolution, uh, changing uh, gender roles, changing uh, social roles, uh, expectations of relationship, family, et cetera. The, the culture was in, 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 in amazing flux. And again, it's not as if Keenholz was the first artist to speak about sex and sexuality in a kind of blatant way. No, it has obviously, well, all of Western art is about sex at some level. Uh, I mean, going as far back as you can go. But, uh, but in the 20th century, in modern art, there were certainly prede uh, predecessors and, and great precedents for this. So I'm showing you Marcel Duchamp's wonderful photograph of this, uh, this dummy that he kind of carted around and he and a couple friends and photographed and, and manipulated. Um, and it became a kind of almost a symbolism for, um, well, I don't know what this is about. Let's just, let's just move along. <laughs> and the abstract expressionist movement, that is the movement into which uh, Keenholz emerges as an artist, uh, there was certainly, we don't like to think of the ABEX movement as having a whole lot of content, social content, although it's, it's present. And I mean, I think today people are more willing to talk about how ABEX had social content. Uh, we like to think of them as formalists. We like to think of them as having internal, you know, the, the psyche is really the content. But I think it's more than that. There was indeed social commentary. And if you look at works like Willem de Kooning's Woman series, Woman and Bicycle series, and if you know, if you, uh, if you know, if you understand the origin of this, you realize that it was really that figure there on the left that inspired that image on the right. And, and clearly, in his own kind of psychotic way, he transforms the beautiful shining Breck girl into a demonic creature. So there were indeed artists who were commenting on uh, the changing values surrounding uh, femininity, around women, uh, the status of women in the culture, the use of the, the female image uh, tropes of beauty, uh, women as, as icons of beauty and, and success in, in society. And, and contemporary avant-garde artists were definitely responding to the, those uh, social changes in their work. Uh, certainly uh, pop made great use because, of course, uh, of the, the female nude and pornographic content as, uh, as the origin of, of, of the art. So this is the work of Tom Wesselman, one of the, the great pop artists, pop painters of that generation. And uh, these are the artists that kind of in some ways surrounded, um, surrounded Keenholz. Keenholz fits well into this generation of artists who looked to the world around them, brought that content back into art. So art, um, there was a, a resistance to doing that because somehow content, political or social, was seen as perverting the kind of formal thrust of the art. And yet these pop artists, the, the enfant terrible of their, of their generation, uh, thrust popular culture back into the face and into the center stage in, in contemporary art. And so um, the great American nude, and I mean, it gets raunchier than, than that, but I think nobody does raunch better than, than Ed Keenholz. And uh, in some ways, he's less explicit than somebody like Tom Wesselman uh, and, less, uh, and less direct in, in his illusions, but no less uh, connected to the, to the content. And that is that sex sells, that sex is very much a part of, uh, of modern American life, mass culture, popular culture. This is the work of Carolee Schneeman. And it's a photograph from a performance piece that was performed about the same time that Keenholz Keen was uh, en entering the, uh, the, the uh, now the national stage in, uh, in, in the visual arts. So yeah, just get into a pile and rub yourself with animal parts, chicken, <laughs> chicken parts and hot dogs and all kinds of stuff. Okay, if these guys were raunchy, Wesselman and, uh, and, uh, and, and the other artists that I've showed you, I think Keenholz was even, even raunchier than that. Uh, Remember, this is an artist who saw himself as working class, saw himself as kind of emerging out of a working class, addressing middle class values, middle class concerns, but also the issues, those important issues that, uh, that affected the middle and lower, lower class life. These, he was not highfalutin by any stretch of the imagination. He was connecting with a, an audience which was very much you know, just, above a not, just above survival on, uh, on the streets of, 
uh, America's urban, urban cities. So what we see here is, in fact, I'm going to turn a light on here. I don't know how I lost that. Um, there we go. Um, so among the issues uh, that, that he addressed were uh, sexual stereotypes, changes in, in those stereotypes. And I think he directly, and in, I, I don't know and I don't think that we can talk about him as a feminist, but there is definitely an argument, uh, uh, almost a point of advocacy for the role of women, the changing role of women in, in the society. So a piece like this is in fact in, intentionally uh, implicates you know, all women certainly, but it, more importantly it implicates the way the culture has constructed uh, uh, the values of what it means to be a woman. So uh, another illegal operation, this one from 1962. Okay, and this is of course his, his, his great masterpiece that I think really directly uh, addresses changing sexual mores. This is a famous ba a backseat dodge uh, from also from 63, uh, a piece that was so shocking that uh, you know there were attempts to ban this thing, consider it pornographic, and I mean it's just an old car for heaven's sakes, and it's just. Can you see it? There are these chicken. There actually there are part dummy and part chicken wire figures in there. I mean it's not like we're looking at a Tom Wesselman nude, you know, borrowed out of Playboy or Penthouse or something. I mean this is this evokes you know, what happens in the backseat of a Dodge in the late 1930s or the 1940s or whatever. But there's nothing explicit about this, but it's really dirty. <laughs> it's really just filthy. It's literally filthy as well as raunchy. Um, and, uh, I mean, there were attempts to censor this thing by the, uh, the county government in, uh, in, uh, in Southern California when, uh, when the thing was, was exhibited. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, you start doing things like this, Locating dummies on, you know, on, uh, on uh, examination tables. And this is called birthday, by the way. I don't know what's, uh, well, obviously there's a celebration happening. There's a party <laughs> happening somewhere here, uh, even though it seems a kind of doer, a, a doer image. But the interesting thing to me about this is that, that clearly the focus of the, the piece is the female body and the attention paid to the body. And, and rather than, than giving us the pinup, Rather than working with the, the idealized female body, he really goes for the body is decrepit, the body is old, the body is maimed, the body is potentially damaged. Uh, I mean, he, he really is, in fact, pushing us to, to the edge of, question, uh, of, of questioning about what woman means to us and what woman, what status she holds in the culture and in the society. So there's probably a lot more happening here in terms of symbolism than that theme, but that's a very important theme to, uh, to Ed Keenholz. <clears throat> I just saw this piece uh, in, um, uh, in Venice. It's installed at the uh, uh, Punta della Dogana, which is a uh, museum. It's the, the Pinot collection. Uh, and uh, it's been reinstalled in this incredible sort of space uh, there in Venice. And this is probably the, his largest exploration of the subject of femininity and class uh, and, and specifically prostitution. Uh, what, what this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, a tableau. And, and of course, these large installations that he created in the, uh, in the late 50s and early 60s are known as tableaus. And then he continued to build them uh, with, uh, with Nancy uh, Keenholz later. Um, they are, uh, again, they are in some cases discrete sculptures. Like, for example, this is a, whoops, no, oh, there we go, no, this is in fact a discrete sculpture here. Units or parts of them are intended to be seen and were at times exhibited as individual sculptures, but really he wanted them to be part of a totality, an entire room, so to see the entire thing is really kind of marvelous and to be, you can't actually walk into this room, you sort of look in the windows into this room, but you sense that what he's created is an environment. It's created a whole setting that evokes, the, and there's even, in this installation, there's even a, a record player playing, and uh, I mean, it even it smells like an old bordello, an old whorehouse in, uh, in Nevada or California. I forget exactly where Roxy's was originally. What he does here is he's trying to evoke a place. He's trying to evoke a memory. He's trying to evoke uh, an experience that he had as a young man the, the, first, the first time, because I'm sure he went back there. The first time he went to, uh, to this place called Roxy's as a teenager. And with all of its, you know, its mis mystery and the mystique of encountering you know, those sexual encounters with these women, uh, as well as the sordid, the degradation of, 
of being in a place like this, you know, exchanging money uh, for sexual gratification. Um, but interestingly enough, what I see in these ensembles, these, uh, these collections of objects, in these discrete sculptures within this whole room, are almost homage to the women who worked there. Uh, and this is a, a detail, this is called uh, Miss Cherry Delight, who was probably a prostitute. I mean, it sounds like a prostitute. Uh, so to me, there's something rather sweet about these things. Yes, there's erosion, and there's decay and all of this stuff. There is you know, poverty here, there's sadness, maybe even corruption in, you know, there's darkness clearly in this. And yet something about the glow, the light, the nostalgia of the wallpaper, all of these materials, create a kind of essence of this human being, this person. And I don't think we're ever far from real people in Keenholz's pieces. You, almost, you always feel the presence of humanity there because these are the things, of course, that people actually handled. I mean, this is not, he didn't actually go and take down an actual brothel and borrow somebody's things. These are just things that he had been collecting over years, composed them to create this kind of fictional character. I don't actually know if Miss Cherry Delight was a real prostitute. I'm sure there was somebody named Miss Cherry Delight in some bordello somewhere. Actually, she's probably performing tonight somewhere in Missoula. But, um, <laughs> but you, do, you do feel some kind of empathy for these, these, uh, these lives and in all their glory and all their, uh, their depravity. So this is more of that, that, entire, that entire environment. And, and you really, and, and one of the interesting things about this installation is the captions or the, 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 the wall text says that it's, uh, that the installation is variable. In fact, it can be, and, and I've seen lots of different images of the way it's been disposed. It is as if the characters, those people could, it could be at one moment there next to the door and another moment lying you know, on a couch or as if the characters were still, or their ghosts were still uh, moving around in the space. This is the madam right here. Pretty powerful critter. Yeah, a, a, a tough, a tough. And actually, in the, 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 uh, the jukebox actually plays the, the tunes. So it's, a, it's a quite an interesting space. She's looking, uh, in, in some installations, she's literally looking at the door. She's always close to the door, well, obviously welcome, I guess. In some instances, she's looking in the mirror, sort of getting herself ready for you know, the, the Don knocking at the door, whatever. It's, uh, uh, you, fe you sense the presence of this being there in, in, a, kind of, in a very, very crude uh, way. Some of the other characters um, parade or hanging out in, in the space itself. There's intimacy in this work. There's um, uh, sometimes you feel like you're too close for comfort, like it's really repulsive. There's attraction and, repuls uh, and repulsion simultaneously in, in all of it. And I just wanted to know that this was not, uh, this not, not always sits well with the powers that be. So this is the uh, county supervisor in uh, LA County and, uh, and, uh, and the county lawyer discussing the relative artistic merits of the piece that you see <laughs> before you. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be OK with whatever they're saying. <laughs> There's a certain familiarity in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that gaze. Yeah, that's a very interesting expression. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> one of the things that one a theme that I that I pick up among him, and 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 again, we're going to con compare him to some of the other great artists of that pop generation, is there is a, a thread of melancholy and, and sadness in in his work. And I think when you see the Jesus corner, you'll, you have a, a, a great sense of that. That when you're in fact dealing with this kind of darker, the darker side of the spectrum, when you're in fact dealing with human emotion and human loss and human fra uh, frailty, that there's clearly a sense of sadness with it. And for a big guy who kind of cut a, 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 a wake in, in the world, he actually seems like a, like a sensitive soul, like somebody who was really at some core level uh, a very melancholic uh, individual. Uh, and again, as many of the great artists, if that duality, that sense of like being brash and brusque and, and almost aggressive in, in the social milieu uh, is often balanced with a, a deep, melancholic internal life. And that's what I see in, uh, in Keenholz as well. So there was plenty of sadness in the late 60s, let me tell you. I mean, and, and there was plenty of it. But in something like this, this is Liechtenstein, uh, a contemporary piece. Uh, from uh, the early early 60s, 
you sense that sadness is, is not kosher in, in the society. It's the exception to the rule. Remember, this is post-Eisenhower America. This is Kennedy Priest assassination. Ken you know, we are in, in, in a state where uh, the good American is a happy American, right? We are, we are a, a happy people. We look on the bright side. We're an optimistic people. The American dream is about flourishing, and it's about youth and vigor. It's never about darkness and decay, and it's never about loss and, and tragedy. We, you know, we, it, we tried very hard, I think, in the 50s and in the, in the 60s to expunge tragedy from the American psyche. Uh, and yet, of course, leave it to the artist to, to understand and, and recognize that there are deep, deep tragedies, both national and personal and individual. And, uh, and that, of course, needs a, a airing in the visual arts. I mean, these works are indeed sad. But think about the sadness here as opposed to the sadness of Keenholz. I mean, this is slick. It's cleaned up. It's somehow um, glossy. It has a kind of slickness to it. It's palatable. I mean, even, the, you know, yes, this image here, I, oops, excuse me. This image is, to me, an image of loss. It's an image of lost innocence. It's an image of, of a tragic life in Warhol's mind. Warhol obviously knew the story of Norma Jean, how her, it, her identity as a real human being was erased by Hollywood and the, the paparazzi and the media transformed into some being. And ultimately, that there was a break there the, between the real person and the fiction. Uh, the fictional Maryland. So I think Warhol understood that tragedy. And yet you look at these colors, and what do you, what do you, what do you think? Happiness, joy, beauty, youth forever. Uh, it's, it's a complete, the, the message in some ways isn't, uh, isn't, isn't coming through. Of course, I don't really know if Warhol had any sentiments. I don't even know if he had a soul. Um, uh, I mean, it's, we're left, actually, I think of, we're left looking at these images with a kind of neutrality about Jackie O's experience or the, the death of Kennedy or the death of a president. I don't think that, that there's advocacy here for empathy or, uh, or um, grieving, even. I, I think this is, in, in typical Warhol fashion, a representation of what is. And then allows you to have the emotion, allows anyone to, to enter with, with your emotional life, because he's not going to give you any, any real clues as to what you're supposed to feel, or even how he feels about this. If you re spend any time reading his diaries, the guy could care less about everything and nothing all at once. There's no sense of, of empathy for, you know, for the subject matter. I think in Keenholz, there is definitely empathy. Uh, see, this is George Siegel, who in some ways comes very close to, because he was a sculptor, because he worked with a human figure, comes very close to, to Keen Holtz uh, in terms of imagery. But then again, and, and every work by Siegel is sad. Because of course they're plastered, they're real. He, I mean, if you're casting real people and you're putting them in these kind of isolating or alienating environments, of course you're going to be sad. And, if, and they become kind of, you're taking this very specific and transforming it into emblems or icons of all of humanity's experience. So, the piece like this, clearly, that figure there is alone and sad. And I guess we're supposed to empathize with him, or maybe we just want to identify with these, because this is where we'd really like to be in, in connection with, uh, with our fellow human beings. But there's no greater sadness and no greater tragedy than, than when you see these tableaus uh, by Ed, uh, uh, Ed Keenholz live. You really sense that there is some horrible, uh, loss has taken place here. Someone has been forgotten. Somebody has been left behind. S time has passed them over. Um, who, we don't know who this being is, right? We, but we're given some clues about that person in these photographs and this kind of shrine-like thing. <laughs> I mean, these bones, the, uh, the clothing. But, and, and then the imagination is left to imagine, well, what are the circumstances? Did the heat go off? Did she die in her sleep? Is she still waiting for her son to call you know, on the holiday? I mean, there is, there's deep, 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 deep disaffection and sadness. And a critique, by the way, of our culture and our society. I mean, for, for an artist who saw himself as a rebel, who was, in fact, rebellious, kind of revolutionary, kind of antisocial in so many ways, he really is, in fact, calling on us to reinvestigate or reexamine our deep social values. Family, love, maternity, right? These, these values that are so essential to, uh, 
to our survival as, as a society. This is such a simple piece, and this is Keenholz, this is both him and, and Nancy from 1981-82. It's, it's one of, probably one of his last works, one of the, uh, the first works without him. Uh, this is a really, really awfully tragic piece. It's called To Mourn a Dead Horse. And, uh, and what you have in it is a, a sort of like a television, it's actually a frame, kind of television screen, glass, and then a photograph in the back of a dead, bloated horse, um, a clock in front of it, and then a couple of objects, just very, very simple, austere even, uh, piece. And yet it's full of, of tragedy and sadness and loss. And, and if you think about his rural upbringing, where he must have seen horses going down, horses dying, animals dying constantly. He understood that, this is, that life is a cycle, of course, and that death is very much a part of it. And of course, death is ever present in, uh, in any tableau, any sculpture by King Holtz. This is considered one of his great masterpieces, and I'm only showing you a, a detail of this. This is in DC, um, but it's, uh, it's called Sali. Uh, 17, and this is a, a little snippet of a very, very large installation where you actually see the building or a corner of the building from, uh, from the hallway, and then you look inside the room, and there's an individual, the, the room inhabited by this individual. And it's, it's the same individual on the bed reading, sitting on the edge of the bed, staring out of the window, and it's a combination of photographs and sculpture and found objects and all kinds of, uh, of stuff. Um, who was Sally? Who was this individual? I mean, it, we're led to believe that there's a real person here uh, named Sally, a person who had it, who, who lived and, uh, and possibly is gone. Uh, he, Keenholz evokes human life even when there may not be an actual person or an actual uh, character there. And of course, this piece, and, and some of you have been to the lectures and have heard and have seen the, the exhibition, I think is a very, very sad piece. And actually, um, uh, Callie was just telling, was it you, Callie, telling me about how there, there were people who lived in this building who, who rented, you know, for a dollar, was it a dollar a day, you know, who were allowed to live in this building for a dollar a day. Uh, when this building was, in fact, dismantled, and of course, we only have this because the building came, you know, came down and, and it, was, it, it, it was gutted, you know, and people took everything out of this building. What essentially was lost was not so much architecture, not a piece of history or urban, urban history. What was lost was a strange and wonderful community of people who lived here and suffered here and died here and experienced that community unraveled. So what we have left here is a piece that evokes all these social relationships, the belief systems that w what was sacred and dear to the people who, uh, who lived in this building. That's what we're, we're, we're gazing into. And, and there are, by the way, there were obviously transformations. You know, the, uh, 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 Keenholz reworked, you know, much of this, but the window itself is virtually intact. This is what was actually left there by, by the people who actually uh, used and created this, this space. So in many cases, I mean, he, uh, uh, or they, in this case, were, were just literally taking, trans, uh, moving, reality from one context into another context, from the context of the street life <coughs> into the context of gallery, art, museum. And just that very translation puts us back on the street, just makes um, what was irrelevant or low class or you know, detestable now valuable, makes it revaluable or more valuable. So. Um, Amazing insight. There he is in front of the, uh, the piece as it was in fact being, as the building was being emptied. Okay. And I think that's Nancy, right? On the, on the right with the, the luggage? Who knows? <laughs> Some of the details. And, and of course, you know, you don't need to see these slides. The piece is just down the hall. Okay. So, um, in many ways, I think he was harsher than his contemporaries. And what I mean by harsher is that maybe not h harder to understand, uh, more incomprehensible. I don't think so. I mean harsher in his critique, and in this case, uh, uh, more astute, deeper, more thoughtful than, than the average pop artist in terms of social critique, and in some ways gutsier about that social critique. And if you think about what it is that he is, uh, what issues that he takes up, 
takes them up with incredible boldness, racism, aging, mental illness, political corruption, uh, poverty, greed, uh, uh, imperialism. I mean, you name it, what was in the, in the American fabric, all the social ills of American life in the, uh, in the decade of the 60s and into the 70s, that appears in his art. And he doesn't shy from these themes. He doesn't tiptoe around them. He, in fact, uh, embraced them and, uh, and, and commented them. So the work is not easy on many, many levels because it's meant to shock us. It's meant to provoke us. It's meant to wake us up in some ways. And it is, in fact, the work is all about advocacy. I mean, if you think about the kind of neutrality of pop art, the way they were simply regurgitating popular culture to us without a kind of heavy message about that, King Holtz was, in fact, giving us a message. Now, of course, there's always an interpretation, and we can argue, and I think the argument is very much a part of that message. But when you look at the work of Klaus Oldenburg, I mean, when you, you know, magnify, give us a large piece of cake made out of rubber or whatever, I mean, you're, what, what is it that you're saying about, uh, about culture? Well, we live in a consumer culture. We're gluttons. Bigger is better. New and improved is better. I mean, these are commentaries, clearly commentaries on American, uh, on American culture in that post, post-war period. But beyond that, what are you supposed to feel about that? What are you supposed to do about that? Buy some more ice cream? Go get a hamburger? I, I mean, really, we don't know what the pop artist really wants us to do with this other than say, oh, there it is, popular culture, mass culture, consumer culture. It's all around us. I think with Keenholz, it's different. Uh, I mean, really, what does Warhol want us to do? Does he want us to buy more Coke? Or, you know, or yes? <laughs> well, he doesn't want any because he's dead. But, uh, <laughs> or Hansen, who I think is also in the same genre, the same vein of critiquing, uh, making direct comments of, you know, on on our society and, and our values and our lack of values, our gluttony, perhaps. Um, uh, but with Keenholz, I think the messages are, are quite clear. This is actually one of my favorite pieces. And this is actually in Germany. And it's probably a good thing that it's in Germany and not in the United States. Because I think that you know, one of the things that he critiqued and critiqued over and over and over again was the ills of nationalism and patriotism. I mean, he really saw, that, yes, patriotism, nationalism all have good sides, but they also have highly undesirable and malignant and inhuman aspects to them. And I think that's what you see uh, most often in his, in his critiques of America. This is, in some ways, an amazing piece. Uh, it is uh, satirical. It is questioning. And by the way, there is a functional, unlike, oops, excuse me, Unlike Warhol's piece, there is a functional Coke machine there. It works. You could literally buy a Coke out of that machine if you wanted to. Uh, I mean, it's it's running during you know all the time. So that and it's you know it's filled with the original Coke bottles. The piece shows us a kind of re restaging of the famous Iwo Jima monument um, on here on the left, and there is an American flag up here, a kind of a decaying American flag, and there is in fact a war monument here, only the dates have been scratched out, so you could literally put in whatever date you wanted on that. And it's a wall of graffiti and Uncle Sam's poster in the back. And, and you're wondering, is he, is he deriding the American military? Look at the year. Look at the year. I mean, is he questioning our military? Is he questioning our military values? Is he questioning our sense of patriotism? These people don't seem to even care because they're too busy having their hot dogs and chili over there. In fact, turning their back on patriotism, or it's as if the, the nation is disconnected. Um, here we have, you know, the the, the evidence of uh, of leisure and pleasure and the good life, and over here we have allusions to what's going on in America, what's going on globally in 1968. I mean, it's it's a dark place, it's a dark. It's a dark year, um, and you know, and the other interesting thing about this is is what's missing here. The absence of these people. Where is everybody? And of course, think about it. It's 1968. You know, the guys are dying over there, and we're getting to watch it on our television screens. And and uh, so, uh, Keenholz didn't didn't shy away from any of these big themes, and certainly didn't shy away from the political, uh, and didn't shy away from commentary. And yeah, and we're left speculating. You know, what is? Does he want us, in fact, to restore? Uh, does he want us to restore 
um, patriotism or nationalism or you know, these good loyalty and love of country? Does he want us to do that, uh, or does he want us to get over you know, this war? Does he want? I mean, we 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 don't have specific answers, but we we know that the questioning is taking place, and the questioning is happening at a very deep level. Okay. So I think that, that Keenholz on many levels was uh, much angrier than the rest of the artists. And that anger sometimes uh, uh, just comes up to the surface. I mean, this is Jasper Johns. You could take this image as a positive image if, if you wanted to. Um, or else you could say, well, that's the American flag in a state of decay. So I mean, you're left to, you know, with obviously those are just dualistic interpretations. And there's probably a whole range of in between. But with Keenholz, I think it's a little bit clearer. Even Rauschenberg, when he does politics, when he embraces the dark side of American politics, there's still something kind of clean and upbeat about this. And, and it's, the, the, it's almost as if the, his organizational skills sort of get over, you know, his design skills in some ways um, defy the, the content or the, the message here. I mean, this is really about the explo America exploding between, you know, uh, Right and left, and between you know those people who you know uh, who would uh, who would kill and assassinate to uh, to gain power uh, or to just change the uh, the dynamic. Yes. That I I think in some ways that you know from the seventies on, from the late sixties through the seventies, that political content re uh, content re-enters the visual arts in this kind of bold, brash, very assertive way. Um, points of advocacy, arguments, all of that comes back into the visual arts, and I think in no small part because of Keenholz. I do think that that decade of his exploring these themes, pushing them, thrusting them in our face in these tableaus and these uh, sculptural groupings, made it then possible for artists like Golub to, to explore themes of torture in, uh, in the 80s. Uh, even artists like, more recently, artists like Botero uh, critiquing torture methods and, you know, and the activities of uh, of governments um, throughout the world. So the Portable War Memorial, in my opinion, in, in the late 60s, not only captures where America is, a kind of the dichotomy of political thinking, um, the, the kind of the distress, the low level of distress, that the, that the, the agony that, that the nation was suffering. But I think it opens up then a discourse, a conversation in the next, uh, in the next two decades in, in, in American art. Here, for example, the soldiers are, are really not there. They're, they're, um, they're vacant, headless creatures. They kind of remind me of Goya's famous painting of the, the uh, 5th of July, you know, where you see in the soldiers are automatons. These soldiers are, aren't even present. It's as if they're fighting a war, but they're not even there. Where are they, psychically, spiritually? They're not, they're not there. OK, maybe there was another angrier artist, <laughs> Francis Bacon. <laughs> But Keenholz was plenty anger, uh, plenty angry at uh, at American society and uh, and certainly the, uh, the the conflicts that we were all experiencing in, in those decades. Okay, so I want to end on a, a kind of lighter note, um, and I want to just say by I want to end by saying that that Keenholz in many ways is also quite humorous and uh, and delights in human folly and our kind of foibles and our our um, uh, and so there is a thread of the joke stirring him and the pulling your leg and the it's not just shocking you but it's also kind of an attempt to delight you as well um, and sometimes he gets us in you know in the in the in the weirdest ways I mean but almost always these pieces have the element of humor and anger and sadness it's all there it's as if it's these every sculpture is an extension of his 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 being his persona okay so I want to end with this this piece and this is called the psycho vendetta case uh, from 1960, it's an early piece, and it, well, I'll, I'll actually, I'm going to read you his own description of it because I think that, that'll get, get to the point, but, uh, but first let me mention that Psycho Vendetta is, a, um, uh, is an allusion to the Sacco Vizzetti trial, you know, the, the miscarriage of justice in American history, it's sort of in all the textbooks as a low moment in American jurisprudence. Um, so this is clearly, the title is an allusion to that. And so that tells us, in fact, what he's critiquing. It has political content, and it's really he's critiquing American law. And there was, in fact, a, a case that happened, uh, another miscarriage of justice in the, uh, in the late 50s that he's alluding to here. It's, in fact, the, the, the case of a uh, Carol Chessman 
uh, who received a death sentence uh, uh, and apparently in a, in a, in a miscarriage of, of justice. But let me describe to you his description of what he's doing here uh, and see if, if you don't buy my concept that he's really quite a, a funny guy. It's just a box that swings open, made out of tin cans. It's got the great seal of approval of California on the surface of it. And when you open it up, it's Chessman with just his ass exposed. The hands are holding a tank periscope. And when you look into that, you read down there, and it says, quote, if you believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, stick your tongue out, limit three times. And you realize while you're, while you're reading that you're lined up exactly with his asshole. <laughs> Okay, I'll let you muse upon that <laughs> as you prepare your questions. <laughs> any uh, any comments or questions? Yes, so, Valerie. What do you think um, Nancy's contribution is? I always wonder what she's actually contributing. Yeah, that's that's a that's a, a great question, and you know I don't know. I never met Keenholz. There are people here who know Nancy, and I would hope that maybe they can answer the question. My suspicion, to be honest with you, is that there was, a, from everything I've read about them, that there was a kind of mind meld between them. That you know, unlike his earlier relationships, his marital relationships, which were uh, not where there was less of that kind of supportive understanding, professional understanding, that she got it. And so I actually think that my my personal answer is that she continued much of his initial agenda. Uh, and that she continues to work out of these themes and these ideas. But let's hear from some of the folks who do know Nancy. I, I would like to answer that if I can. Um, I don't know Nancy well, but it's my cousin, and uh, my dad and Ed grew up together, so watching this and listening to it is very interesting to me, and I've, I've been trying to formulate an opinion about that exact question. And I think that what I see in looking at the before and after Nancy's presence is I don't see Ed's work as, as much of a, of a political commentary as I see it as a social humanitarian commentary and an emotional expression of things that he saw that was wrong with the world and things that I can tie into my own knowledge of my dad who's raised with him and understanding their psyche. And I think that when Nancy came in, she really refined uh, the politics, the color. She brought color into his work. Uh, she brought definition to his work that was very different. And um, so I think that uh, there's a progression there, but there's definitely a before and after. I think it's worthy to see them in that way and, um, as a before and, and with her. I, I see it as two different works completely, and I, I'm getting better at being able to formulate that that makes sense. So I think she had a tremendous contribution, but I think as every person, he was a different person before her, and obviously was a different one after. And I think that a lot of the interpretation, like as a viewer, we look at the work and we, we see what we see. We don't know what they felt. When I look at it, I see my family, I see my dad, I see things that were wrong with my dad or wrong within my home that I know they shared those common experiences and so it speaks to me in that way it, it, differently than it does if I'm just interpreting a piece and so, so that's how I see that and I think Nancy's a very very important part of this work but I think as they move forward that it, it probably will be important to differentiate the, the pre keyholds and the post King Holt era, um, and, and especially to give her credit as a woman for what she brought to that, and to give him credit for recognizing that, which we all know is part of their work. But I think it's it's a neat thing. So that's my two bits. Thank you. That's that's marvelous to hear that. Yeah, and and I uh, and I do I, I would agree with you. I think that the the political content is much sharper and much more focused. In, uh, and more specific in some ways in the in the post uh, the uh, the post death work yeah yeah and do you think that that Ed was um, 
originally more attracted to bigger ideas about humanity and loss and war than he was specific to our country, our region, our, our place. I think he was more, from looking at the work, I think he was more emotional. And I think that he became more conceptual because we all do that. We make adjustments as we go through life. Something really disturbs us and then we have to figure out how to make sense of that thing. And I think that Nancy was in the part of his life where he could, and she, could make sense out of things. And looking at her background, coming from a police family and living in LA, that they both had, and, and knowing my family, I know there were disturbing observations that were made. And so I think that he was expressing that, and then it was refined later with her. That's how I see it. Wow. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Dane. He holds shares of common ground with Duchamp and sort of the absurdity and the use of tableaus and other facets of his work, like he made him continue some of that work and added a political on it. Uh, well, actually, there, it, it's like I said, I think of, of Duchamp as kind of his uh, almost his spiritual or his aesthetic guide, uh, kind of an early guide for him. Um, I mean, even the sense of humor, that they, they both used humor as a, as a means of hooking us, grabbing us, and then they would deliver the critique, you know, the, the social commentary. And that social commentary could often be pretty biting. Uh, so, so yeah, I think I think there's lots and lots of parallels there. Um, the, almost always, what you see in, in, in Duchamp is a, almost like he, his work is a mirror to us. Uh, obviously, a lot of his work was pure kind of like a, a kind of game, but we do see ourselves in it in a kind of turned upside down sort of fashion. Keenholz, in some ways, is a mirror, but that likeness is much more close. It's much more uh, tied to us. So. Um, uh, it's there's a certain grit there and a kind of authenticity that that even in in, in uh, Duchamp isn't isn't present. That's just my take. Other questions out there? I got one. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, about his perception, um, particularly in Europe, and I spent some time in Berlin, and a lot of the images that you show are in um, European collections. Yeah. And it strikes me as being a, such a inherently American work, um, a, lot, a lot of Western work, uh, especially. Um, and I'm wondering if it is seen that way as, as an American, I was talking about American issues, or the more international. Yeah. Um, he, he was extremely well received in, uh, in Germany uh, in the last two decades of his life and spent a lot of time there, lived there. Uh, uh, most in Berlin, and the the criticism. If you read any of the any of the stuff, I mean, no artist could do better. Or could, I mean, he walked on water there. Um, they loved him, and I think, uh, and, and and a lot of that has to do because he it was such a frank and honest, in my opinion, a frank and honest look at American culture, American life, and of course, Germans, especially in Berlin, were completely fascinated with. Uh, both east and west, because you know he was in Berlin before the wall came down. So, but both east and west Berliners and, and Germans were, since World War II, have had this um, unbelievable. Well, even before World War II, fascination with American culture. So to see American culture like this through his through his eyes was was very very gratifying to them. So much of American popular culture was, you know, the Germans just loved it and ate it up. So to have it kind of process and regurgitated to them in this way was a very important um, an important thing. I also think that what he did is he provided Europeans a kind of cathartic experience that they themselves couldn't have with their own history and their own popular culture. I mean, you'll find this kind of art later in the 70s in Austria, and you'll find it in Germany, and you'll find it in France. But nobody in Europe was doing this kind of social critique criticizing their own societies like Keenholz was doing us, or criticizing humanity as a whole. So what he did is he, he allowed a kind of catharsis for Germans. Remember, Germans have always been skeptical of touching nationalism since World War II. You know, their constitution forbids nationalism. I mean, thou shalt not like Germany anymore. I mean, it's almost like in, in written, in written in the text. So these subjects are so sensitive and touchy for them. 
at the same time, they, here they see this young nation out there doing its thing globally, asserting itself, stumbling, falling, cr making chaos everywhere at once, supporting dictators here, having wars over there, over ridiculous issues like oil, I, whatever, you name it. At the same time, America to Germans was Kennedy and optimism and, and, you know, and modernity and progress. So to have an artist who could tackle those, those subjects so forcefully and so frankly was, you know, it was like a breath of fresh air. So when you read those critiques of his work, and I could just imagine, I mean, certainly the conservatives in those cultures would look at this stuff and go, yuck. Well, there's plenty of conservatives here going, yuck, looking at this work too. But in general, the Europeans were in some ways more open to Keenholz than, um, than, than critics and, 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 and people here in this country. Steve. I would, uh, I love your approach tonight, and I love the fact you ended with humor because he was really funny. And I would add. One but I started with humor. Did you see that funny? <laughs> <laughs> but I would add one more adjective, and that was he was fearless. Yeah. And when you walk into a gallery and you're yeah. experiencing these pieces that are so cutting or critical, or in your face, takes guts. And he did it over and over and over again. And he faced down, you know, LA society. He's faced down all of these critics that came out. Big time. And yeah. he stood up. And it's, it's an overwhelming thing to experience so much work by him. And you just realize he had so much guts and courage and spirits. You know, it, it, a funny thing kind of has been happening to me as I've been getting ready for this lecture because I've, you know, we've had now a couple months to, you know, to read and think about it. I've been reading Hemingway, rereading Hemingway. Everything I read as a kid in high school or whatever, I've just been, you know, and um, so in, in a weird way, I sort of conflated Ernest Hemingway and Edward Keenholz. I mean, I, they've been in my brain, the, the sort of like maybe sort of the sub-brain, you know, at, at night. Read, read some, read some Keenholz at work and then go home and read Hemingway before I fall asleep and dream about both of them. And, you know, <laughs> there is a kind of Hemingway, a, a, this is a big man clearly a big guy who had a big presence and who was indeed, you know, who embraced life kind of in, in its fullness and its totality. And he reminds me a great deal about Hemingway. You know, Hemingway's story also has, is laced with tragedy and sadness. And, 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 and that's also true of Keenholz. Uh, I mean, what life doesn't have those elements? But it, this life was a grand life. I mean, it was a big, big life. Alley. Earlier, when we were talking about the Dollar a Day hotels, and that's actually Solid 17, and I'm pretty sure that that is a, 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 a Spokane room. Yeah. And, that, yes. yeah. and that's yeah. the story of those, and it's, a, it's the story of our time right now. Yes, you know, when yeah. How many of us know those single people who are in their, in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and planning their last decades or so, and they go, oh, I'm going to go over here and be really safe. Yeah. You know, and a dollar a day hotel is the perfect thing, and I'll build my little community here. And, and, and then, like, um, the World's Fair comes to Spokane, you know, and blocks of that city are wiped away because they don't look quite good enough. Yeah. And by doing that, they remove this whole society that that is a close knit neighborhood. You know, and, and those dollar day places disappeared and and it fell down around people who had made real solid plans for their last decades. And I think it, it's a real testament to to who Ed and Nancy are is is they address who we are as a democracy and just that real primal thing of we are our brother's keeper. That's in the contract. And Ed really prided himself in not being a stuffy intellectual, but being every man. And that's why his work is dirty. That's why yeah. he's funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he's in the fiber of life. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So I think we need now to go visit the shrine. Yeah. And, 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 and.